Welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. We will begin with our opening hymn, which you will find on the screen. The hymn is also found near the middle of the red hymnal. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. Please stand. Our worship continues using the common service, which you will find on page 15 in the front of the red hymnal. You also find the words displayed on the screen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, 
I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word, that we may abide in your Father's house forevermore. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. As you may have noticed from uh, some of the words of the opening hymn, or from the prayer of the day that I, just, that I just prayed, or from the introduction in the front of the service folder, uh, today is Good Shepherd Sunday. Today is the day when we celebrate Jesus being our shepherd. Um, and we also have a couple of readings that talk about people as our sort of in between shepherds. Because even though we know Jesus is our good shepherd, we can't see Jesus here. He went up into heaven and has left us to take care of things as best we're able. And so this reading from Acts chapter 20 has Paul talking to the elders at the church of Ephesus, which was a city where Paul had done ministry for three years. And he had trained these men. He had warned them about what was coming next, saying, people are going to attack your church, your flock, and it is your duty to protect them. And even now, God puts elders and leaders in his churches, and he asks them to watch over his flock. A reading from Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, Savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. This reading is very similar. Um, here, it's not Paul speaking, but it's Peter. And he's talking about the way that elders and the way that God's leaders ought to conduct themselves. We recognize this is not always what happens, but this is what they're supposed to do. 
They're supposed to be selfless. They're supposed to be humble. They're supposed to be giving of themselves, recognizing their position. They are taking care of people in the same kind of way that Jesus, as our good shepherd, takes care of us. A reading from 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Gospel reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Reading begins at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Our worship continues as we join in confessing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We read together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our hymn of the day, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. First of all, if uh, my voice goes out at some point, I'm sorry. I was, we had a fire last night, and I inhaled a lot of smoke. Um, unintentionally, I didn't do it on purpose, but it's, you know, I, when you have a fire and you sit there and the smoke blows in your face and you move to the other side and the smoke blows in your face, it was one of those. So if my voice goes out, that's why. This reading is sort of challenging in the sense that it's hard to know what exactly to say because it was spoken to a very specific group of people. Just like uh, the reading that we heard earlier from the book of Acts, where it was Paul speaking to a very specific group of people that was the elders at the church in Ephesus. And as Paul said goodbye, it was very tearful uh, because Paul had, had raised up these men. They were leaders in the church, and he knew he was never going to see them again. In fact, he was about to go off to Rome and, uh, well, face trial. And in the same sort of sense, um, it's sort of the way I think about verses that talk about the Pharisees. We know that Jesus spoke against the Pharisees many different times, and on some level, um, we do the same things that the Pharisees do, the Jewish religious leaders of the time, the way that they were hypocrites, the way that they talked down to other people. We do those same sorts of things. So I can talk about that, but it is a bit different because we don't all have the same amount of responsibility and leadership in the church. I guess I'll explain by talking about what elders were um, the kind of elders that Peter's talking about here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Because at St. James, we have elders. We have people who are, they're on the board, they're elders. Those are their names. You have their email addresses. You can contact them if you would like. But it's a different sort of thing than what we see in the Bible. And here's why it's different. Um, at our church, we have a pastor, and then we have different leadership below him, we have different leadership below them, all the way down. And at some point, everybody's responsible for something, more or less, around here. But that's not the way that things worked in the early church. Elders were essentially pastors. They were people who are responsible for the spiritual well-being of the church. And so, Peter says, to the elders among you, to these small group of people who are in charge spiritually of the church, I appeal to you um, as a fellow elder. The early church adopted this sort of model of church government, and it goes back to what the people were used to seeing. Because in the Jewish synagogues, there would be elders. They'd be old, wise men who were in charge of the spiritual well-being of that group of people. Even when we hear about Jesus standing on trial, he stood before the elders of the Sanhedrin. Not just the whole Jewish ruling council, but he specifically was to answer to the elders of those people. And so the Jewish people had elders. The early Christian church had elders. Um, and when we hear about the responsibilities that elders had, some of them were preaching. Some of them were teaching. Some of them were um, administering the church, so they were administration. Uh, they did all sorts of different things. So we don't have a one-to-one -one comparison with really any of our roles besides possibly me. And I'm not just going to preach a sermon to myself, so we're going to have to relate on some level to what's going on here. But I think we can understand from these verses the way that things are supposed to be and the way that they often turn out to be instead. Peter says, I, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. And then he, later on, he gives three different commands. He says, do this, don't do that. And yet, many of you have been in churches where leadership has abused their position for one reason or another. Peter says, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will share in the glory to be revealed. He says, I... I was a witness of Christ's sufferings. I saw that, but I also know that there's glory coming later. And he mentions the same sort of thing uh, later on in the verses, saying, at some point, glory is coming. 
in the future. But right now, there's suffering. And that could be the theme of the entire church, but it's also important to tell leadership in the church that as well, because even church leadership can get the idea that they're running their own little personal kingdom, and that glory is right now and not later. No, suffering is right now. I get to talk to a lot of pastors who, and I'm guilty of this too, who get the idea, everything should be good. Why can't everything just be good all the time? And uh, there never have to be any struggles. There's never any difficulty in church. Everyone gets along. Everyone agrees. Nobody causes any dissension. Um, Everyone has perfect understanding all the time. Why can't it just be like that? No. There is suffering now. Glory is coming later. And then here are the three things that he tells the church to do. Verse 2 starts out saying, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. There's a lot to talk about in just that one verse. He tells them to be shepherds, not of their own flock, but of God's flock. And even though I talk about this group of people here, and I say it's my church, it's not so much my church as it's God's church, and I happen to be here. And our other church leadership here, it's not our church, it's not our group, like it belongs to us. All of this belongs to God. We're just here right now. And I guess that point is punctuated even more because over time, people have left this church or other churches, people who are in roles of leadership, people who are in charge of things, people who started things from the ground up and said, nothing will ever be the same after I leave, and yet things keep going somehow. No church or group or anything rests just on one person, unless that person is Jesus. He tells them to serve as overseers, not because they must, but because they are willing, as God wants them to be. God wants people to be willing to serve. And if they're not willing to serve, he says, then don't serve. Of course, God often makes us do whatever he wants us to do, whether we're willing or not, and often we're not. But specifically talking about church leadership, God says, I want you to be willing to serve. If you did it out of some sense of obligation, after a while you'd probably resent it. You'd probably hate it. You'd hate your job. You'd start to hate the people that you serve because you aren't willing. Anybody who gets into any position of church leadership has to be willing to give up certain things. On some level, they have to give up their vision of what they want. They have to be willing to deal with sheep, deal with people who are misguided or don't have a full understanding or go off on the wrong path, they have to be willing to pull them back. You know, that's a part of the job of the church. It's to get people to heaven, even when they're not willing. Sometimes we have to go after people and drag them into heaven if we have to. God wants his people to be willing to serve, just as he served us. We heard a reading from the Gospel of John where Jesus was talking about how he was the good shepherd. And I'm not preaching on that text, but the point he makes over and over and over again, I think it's at least four times in those verses, is he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's what I came to do. Jesus came to serve us. Not just serve us, he came to live and to die for us. And he asks church leaders to serve we don't have any excuse why we shouldn't, because he didn't just serve us, he died for us. He forgave us. He showed mercy to people who didn't deserve it. And we have received that mercy, so how can we not give that to others as well? The second thing that Peter mentions here, right after he talked about um, being willing, then he says, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. How do those two things go together? Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Have you ever seen a church 
where people were greedy for money. Yes, I have. I was at a church where people were greedy for money. I was at a church once where the pastor got removed uh, because he and his son were taking money from the church. They had the credit cards. Nobody was checking up on them. The way they thought about it was, the church doesn't pay us enough, so it's fair for us to use the church credit card to buy our groceries. And, you know, to, to fix our car, because we use our car for the church, so why don't we do that, too? And, you know, if anybody comes to stay at our house, we can call it a ministry expense, and we can pay for all of their expenses using the church credit card. And you can talk yourself into all sorts of things and say that it's good. Right now, we know that there are pastors who are in those positions because they're eager for money. You can go online and look up some of the richest pastors in the world, and you can see how wealthy they are with all of their vehicles and all of their expensive suits, and at the same time, how they plead for donations, saying, your money is valuable and vital to our ministry. It's not, fine. It's not hard to find pastors who are like that. God says, that's not what church leaders are supposed to be. You're not supposed to be greedy for money. You're supposed to be eager to serve, not looking at this position like this is something where I can raise myself up, where I can make some money off of it, where I can raise my own status. This is an opportunity to serve people. It's not to put myself up, it's to bring myself down. It's to put others on top. It's to humble myself. And that is often not what we see from church leadership. But God says that's the way it's supposed to be. The third thing he says in verse 3 is not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This one is pretty straightforward. Anybody who gets in a position of leadership, and I'm not just talking about the church, but I'm talking about anything, will get the idea that the rules no longer apply to them. They said, I paid my dues, I put my time in, and now I'm going to do whatever I want. If you've ever driven down the road and saw the speed limit was 55, and especially if you're driving between Milwaukee and Chicago on the highway, you see a police car flying down at 75, 80 miles an hour, said, if I did that, I would get pulled over. Where is, is the policeman in a hurry? Is he going somewhere? I don't know. The idea that the rules don't apply to us. I've seen people at grocery stores, employees, say, I'm not going to wait in that line. And they've walked over to a register, turned it on, put in their information, checked out, and then turned it back off again, and then left. And maybe they have every right to do that, but it still doesn't sit well with me. The idea that some rule doesn't apply to you anymore. And once again, Peter says, don't lord it over those entrust, entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. You can think about it in terms of sports, too. Because at some point, the best players on the team are so much better than everyone else, even if they didn't practice, even if they didn't work hard, they would still be better. And they might say, I, I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to practice. I'm already better than you anyway. But that's not what, what being an example is. There are some people in this church that could take their Bible off their nightstand and close it, and put it on their shelf, and leave it there for an entire year. And at the end of that year, they would still know more than someone who was reading it every single day. That doesn't mean that any of us should give up reading God's word. Some of us could think we could give up praying as though that wasn't the most important thing, that I know how to communicate with God, I don't have to pray like this anymore, God already knows what I want to say, as though prayer wasn't important. But that's not what being an example looks like. Being an example means doing the right thing 
all the time, even when nobody's looking. It means being humble. It means serving. And I think we all know what could happen and what has happened when God's servants have not looked like this. When God's servants have not been willing to serve, when they've been stubborn, said, I don't want to serve. You know what the dropout rate for pastors is? Between all church bodies, 10 years in, it's about 50%. Even in our own church body, the burnout rate for pastors after 10 years is over 25%. 25% of all people went through college, went through seminary, started out in the ministry, and stopped being willing to serve. What happens when God's people are greedy for money? Well, we know what happens. There's a reason that the church has that reputation of always wanting more and more money. If you talk to somebody outside the church and they say, the church just wants my money, where do they get that idea from one of God's people who just wanted their money? And the idea that things don't, they don't apply to us. That rule doesn't apply to me. I don't have to do that. I don't have to ask for permission. I'm just going to do what I want. Well, that can affect all of us. And the amount of damage that can be done when God's servants don't recognize this is not my flock. This is not my house. It doesn't belong to me. I'm just a temporary caretaker. This is God's flock. So many people can be led astray to buy into the idea of this famous pastor or that famous ministry saying, I want to be a part of that. If I can't be a part of that, am I really part of the church? Peter recognizes that he's asking God's people a lot to be humble, to submit, to put others above themselves, to consider them as more important. Peter says, I saw Christ suffer. I saw the good shepherd suffer for his flock. I saw Jesus die for us. I saw Jesus promise us a home in heaven that's better than this one. I know that one day Jesus is going to take away all of this suffering, all of this trouble, all of the struggles that come from church, all of the unpleasantness, it's going to be gone. And on that day, everyone who has trusted in him, everyone who has served faithfully for him, will receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. This is not my church. This is not your church in the sense that it belongs to you. This is God's church. This is not my kingdom. This is not the little corner of the earth that you rule over. It's still God's church. And the moment that we start thinking it's ours and it belongs to us and we can do whatever we want, we get off the right track. This church is an opportunity for all of us to serve, especially for church leadership. Not to have exactly what you want all of the time, but to serve those who have less understanding than you, those who are less patient than you, those who are less loving than you. Because you know what Jesus did? To people who understood less than them, less than him, he died for them. To people that had less love than Jesus did, he died for them. To people that keep trying to hold on to this church like it's theirs, Jesus loves them and forgives them. This is God's church. We are just shepherds. Amen. Our worship continues as we ask our God to give us clean hearts using the song uh, Created Me, which is found on page 20 in the front of the red hymnal. You'll also find the words on the screen. Please stand. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Amen. You may remain standing for the prayer of the church. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word, and so keep us in the one and only true faith. Lord, forgive the sins of your people, strengthen the doubting and faithless, bring back the forgetful and wayward, and comfort the anxious and the distressed. Lord, we offer special prayers for our members and for those who are sick and suffering. We pray for the son of Darlene Rodriguez, who is beginning a new sort of therapy. We ask that you would comfort him with your presence and with the message of forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. We pray for Kathleen Capuano, who is recovering from surgery, for Bernice Miller and Linda Kraft, for Jerry Begalke and Carol Brandt, for John Conrad, Shirley Schultz, and Marie Wagner, for Karen and Gordon Vetting, for Kathleen Begalke and Donald Wiege. Lord, please be with all of these members, as well as those that are going through troubles and trials that we know nothing about. Lord, comfort them with your presence and with the knowledge that in Christ all sins are forgiven and eternal home in heaven is promised. As we go from this holy place today, grant peace and rest to us all. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who by his sacrifice took away the sins of the world, and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you in one true faith to life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. You may live in peace. Amen. We stand for thanksgiving. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. Jerusalem the Golden. That hymn is not in our hymnal because it only goes up to like 600 something. So it should be printed as an insert in your worship folder. You'll also find the words on the screen.
Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to have all of you here. Got a lot of things that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, one of them is about the signing up for the 100th anniversary celebration on June 6th. After today, we are opening up to people outside of the congregation, people who aren't members. So a lot of you are members um, and are not signed up yet. Actually, I don't know if a lot, I didn't even check, but it's like we are at like 80 people right now and we're expecting limited capacity. So if you would like to be able to make it for sure, please go to either the St. James website and sign up or speak to Tim Meister who has his computer here today. All right, well, sorry about that. Um, let's see, what else did I want to bring up? Um, some of you, and, I, and it, the, the announcement came in too late to get it in the bulletin, but coming up is our Ascension service on May 13th. That's a Thursday at 6.30. And we've, for the last however many years, we've had that together with other churches. So we've had that with Abiding Word and St. Matthew and Saloa. And the pastors have come together. There's been a joint choir and a big celebration and food. And we can't do all of that this year. There's not any food. There's not a choir. But there are pastors and potentially people. That could be you. It's not going to be here at St. James. It will be at St. Matthew. And because there's four churches coming together, they expect there will probably uh, will run up against the um, attendance limit, you know, if everybody who's interested wants to go. So... If you'd like to register for that, I, if, you have, if I have your email address, you already got an email about it. But if I didn't, if I don't have your email address, you can go to St. Matthew's website, and we'll put that in the bulletin for next Sunday. Um, it just it came in Thursday late after we'd already printed everything. But um, that's coming up on May 13th. That's a Thursday evening, and you're certainly welcome to be involved in that service, to, to come and sing and worship with other fellow believers. Oh, I feel like there was more that I wanted to say. Um, we're continuing our preparation for the 100th anniversary service, and so after worship next Sunday, the choir is going to start meeting and practicing for that, which means that this Sunday, Bible study will be here in the sanctuary, and we're continuing our series that we started last time. But after that, we're going to Bible study will be in the, in the uh, gymnasium. I think that's what it's called, right? on the blueprints even, gymnasium. So you're welcome to take part in that. We'll actually have some different people helping to lead some of our elders in, the, in our sense, not New Testament sense. Some of our elders are going to help lead Bible study. So if you're sick of me, it's great. Um, and if you like me, we'll be using my printed material that I came up with. So it's a win-win. I think that's about all I have to say. Um, I will greet you as I find you around the building. And uh, have a great day, everyone. It's good to be back.